Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. It's been almost a year now since we launched the podcast, and I want to thank everyone for all the positive feedback and support I've received. I've got some amazing guests in the works and can't wait to share the information with you guys. I'm also hoping to add some more educational videos and blogs to the website in the coming months. Don't forget, if you want to stay up to date with everything we are up to, you can subscribe to our newsletter on our homepage at www.kisorganics.com. I promise we won't share your information and won't blow up your inbox with emails. Anyway, let's get on with today's show. Our guest this week is Casey Schoenberger. Casey is the Director of Sales for DRAMS Corporation's Fertilizer and Farm Segments. DRAM produces dramatic fish hydrolysate fertilizers. In addition, he and his wife Shelly operate Happy Little Farm in Conway, Washington, growing a variety of fruits, vegetables, and nuts. I brought him on to educate us on fish hydrolysate and other fish products. How are they made? Are they sustainable? What's the difference between fish hydrolysate and fish emulsion? And much, much more. Here's our conversation. All right. Hey, Casey, thanks for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, Ted. Yeah. Can we give listeners a little bit of, of your background into uh, how you got into farming and specifically more of these, uh, this, these fish products? Yeah, sure. Um, kind of a, a funny story um, taking me from my home and leading me back to my home. Um, so I, I grew up in Wisconsin and went to college there. Um, and while I was in, in college, I um, came out here to where I'm, I'm currently uh, living in the Seattle area. Um, and I came out to study killer whales and um, out in the San Juan Islands, uh, just off of uh, north of Seattle, and loved it out here. Um, and ended up sticking around in the area and getting into teaching environmental education um, and got uh, really into that, really in, in, enjoyed that and kind of found a, a calling, I guess. And um, that led me into really looking at uh, the environmental side of our, our food systems, uh, diving in uh, deep on that, uh, trying to figure out how we're going to grow food in the future so that we're not harming future generations. That led me to spending a year on a permaculture farm out there called Bullock's Permaculture Farm, um, where I learned a lot of sustainable living skills, a lot about growing food, and just honestly really nerded out with a stack of books from the library next to my bed every night and learning everything I could um, about growing fruits, vegetables, nuts. Let's see. And then left there, uh, my wife and I moved back to her family's farm where she grew up, and we ended up buying a a 20-acre chunk from her parents um, and started doing a, a community-supported agriculture farm um, and immediately planted everything we could. So every fruit, nut, and vegetable that you can grow in the climate, which is, you know, for your listeners, a great way to um, make sure that there's always something to do outside and also a really good way to make sure that you never turn a profit, uh, <laughs> trying to be so diversified. But it's, you know, our pantry always looks amazing and it, it's really fun and educational, um, just probably not the greatest business plan in the world. Um, so we continue to do something like that in some form every year. We do a lot of work trade because um, we both work off the farm. And so uh, that led me, um, I went back and visited my family in Wisconsin and ended up bringing my wife and kids to take a tour of this fertilizer plant, this organic fertilizer plant I'd heard about that's just five minutes from my parents' house. So this is kind of near Green Bay, Wisconsin, right on Lake Michigan. And um, I took the tour, not really knowing what I was getting into, and watched the process of this recycling of fish scraps that we'll, we'll get into more here on this call, and got to the end of it and just said, wow, this is amazing. You guys are taking a, a waste uh, waste stream source and making this incredible fertilizer out of it. And this is five minutes from where I grew up. This is crazy. 
And uh, we got to the end, and they actually mentioned that they're looking to hire somebody out in the Seattle area to work with the Alaskan fisheries um, on obtaining scrap. And I said, well, give me a call. And uh, one thing led to another, and here I am eight years later of working for DRAM. So now I'm currently the director of sales of our fertilizer division. Now, I grew up knowing about DRAM because my parents owned a nursery. But when I think of DRAM, I think of sprayers and I think of hoses and, and things like that. So what can you talk a little bit about what DRAM overall as a corporation uh, does? I know they have hands in a lot of different aspects of agriculture. Sure. And that's, yeah, I, I'm right with you where, where I had worked at a nursery as the, you know, the edible food, the edible plant specialist. And, and that's what I knew DRAM as, is anything that you screw onto the end of a hose has DRAM's name on it. So the water wands. So the company actually started like 80 years ago now. So we celebrated our 75th anniversary just recently. Really cool company created in, in or started in Wisconsin. And the, 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 the flagship invention was the water breaker. So you're familiar with that, the, the screen that softens the water spray so that you don't trample your flowers when you're, when you're watering them. And so that's still what a lot of people know DRAM for is, you know, go into any floriculture greenhouse or anything and, and what you screw onto the end of a hose. DRAM also has, a, you know, developed a, a line of um, uh, home gardener tools. Uh, and so you go into an independent garden center and you'll see big colorful racks of, of sprinklers and hoses and, and um, stuff you screw on to the hoses. And then our commercial division that I was just describing does, you know, if you, if you build a greenhouse, we do pretty much, we can do pretty much everything after that. So the fan layout, the um, irrigation systems, known a lot for really high quality sprayers, chemical applicators. We do the hoses and, and so on. Um, we have another division that um, deals with, it's our newest division dealing with water purification systems using ozone, so more high capital projects. And just the coolest company to work for, we're, you know, family owned and, and Nobody ever leaves. The joke is, you know, nobody ever leaves the company. So every, a lot of people have been there for 20, 30 years and, and, and so on. So that was a long way of saying uh, uh, about 20 years ago, the, the owner of the company, Kurt Dram, started using a fish fertilizer in Wisconsin and was amazed at his little, you know, his, his, his small um, hobby greenhouse at the results he was seeing, you know, just on plants like cyclamen and so on. And he went to the, to the plant and took a look at it. And at that time, it was pretty run down and open tanks. And it was near the high school, near the high school that I actually went to. Um, and ended up buying the plant and buying a building and really um, making everything, you know, state of the art as far as fish fertilizer goes. Um, and so we're really proud of our plant. It's very clean. Um, and we've just recently invested in, in a lot more um, storage so that we can age the, pro the product longer. And I'll, I can get into that a little bit more later. But yeah, we've been doing the fish fertilizer thing for about 20 years. Reason a lot of existing DRAM customers don't know about it is we, you know, we, we do a lot of the other DRAM business for indoor um, growing the floriculture um, industry. And the fish fertilizer just naturally fits a lot more in the outdoor agriculture. So we sell a lot of it in 5,000 gallon tanker loads to outdoor growers. Yeah, and I want to get into that uh, on scale affordability and, and some of the issue, issues around application methods and rates. But can we just talk a little bit more about the process itself? So most people have heard of fish fertilizer, but that carries a lot of that, that falls into a lot of different categories. And, and many people aren't aware of the differences. And I would say the two big ones in terms of uh, liquids, when we talk about liquid applications would be emulsion or hydrolysate or hydrolysate. You were, we were talking before the podcast and you said it could be pronounced either way. I've always said hydrolysate. Uh, so can you describe sort of that uh, process in terms of how emulsion is made and how hydrolysate is made? And then we can look into some of the ways that they're different. Sure. Yeah. Um, and it's a common question, like you said, and, and, you know, especially when I, when I started emulsions were around more, I, I, I don't see it as much, especially on the, on the commercial scale. Um, I think you, you know, if you still go into a box store, there's going to be a, a fish emulsion on the shelf. The fish emulsions are, are a, a, a thicker material. They're usually lower. They're, I, I mean, they're always um, lower price tag. And so that's always attractive, usually less than half the price of a, of a hydrolysis. The, the emulsions, uh, as far as I know, are usually made from menhaden from the Gulf of Mexico. 
Um, and so there's some concerns there with sustainability. And now I say that uh, knowing there's probably some other um, emulsions on the market that aren't made from that, that source. A lot of times, uh, as far as I know, the emulsions, they'll remove um, proteins um, and some of the oils, and that's a big one for us, is the hydrolysis will usually have a good fish oil content in them, and we think that that's very beneficial. So what you get at the end with the emulsions is a thicker material um, that's going to be higher in nitrogen. So that's obviously something that growers like. So you have a cheaper, cheaper um, fertilizer that's usually an analysis of something like 5-1-1, so 5% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, and 1% potassium. It, whereas like the hydrolysis, our, our hydrolysis, our base is a 2-5-0.2, so 2% nitrogen, 5% phos, 0.2% potassium. And that's, we're a little bit higher in phos than some other ones, but that's, those are, those are in general are, are pretty close to the numbers. So then you might ask, why would you buy the hydrolysis? Why is the hydrolysis more popular than the emulsion? Um, the big difference is we're not heating it up and removing all that stuff. And so what you have is this, this low heat process um, where the vitamins, the proteins, the amino acids are not broken down. And so the, the, the general thought is that the hydrolysis feed beneficial fungus and bacteria like nothing else. So... I would say that more than 50% of our business is customers not buying on NPK. Um, they're definitely not buying on nitrogen per dollar. That's just never the case with hydrolysis. What, what they're usually buying is this incredible food source. And so, you know, we can get into this later, but a lot of times our, our fish will be sold right with uh, uh, some sort of biological product. You know, are you, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the bugs in a bottle idea big industry of folks trying to isolate the good guys. Um, you know, compost tea would be a way of, of doing that by yourself. And then, you know, there's plenty of companies that um, are really trying to isolate a handful of really good um, bacteria. And so they would sell that along with our fish to help multiply it once it goes on your, on your plant or on your field. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that aspect of it, that microbial side of things. But, uh, can you just explain a little bit about how uh, emulsion is just how it's made? You mentioned high heat in that process, and then typically this menhaden. This yeah, piece and of I, fish. you know, I, I've never been in an emulsion factory, and so I'm a little bit hesitant to, you know, go on record telling you how it's made. Um, okay. But but yeah, what what I've been told is that you're, you're using ocean fish, you're 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 heating um, to extract the oils and the proteins. Sometimes that oil will be sold off separately as, uh, for cosmetic industry and so on. And in some cases, protein is removed for livestock feed. And then you have this thicker liquid left at the end. And so it's, you know, a waste product of a waste product. Um, that said, I'll, I tell people, you know, if you're looking for a cheap source of organic nitrogen, you know, try to make sure it's an actual organic emulsion, you know, that they're using an organic process and not throwing something else in there. And usually if it's a 511 or a 411, definitely not a bad source of nitrogen. It's just not going to be as good of a, a microbial food source as a hydrolysis it will be. Yeah, in my experience, and also this is a lot of the work from uh, Tim Wilson of Microbe Organics, was that uh, when you start using uh, f these fish products, emulsion or hydrolysate in compost teas, the emulsion uh, would actually inhibit microbial growth in a lot of cases whereas the hydrolysate is one of the best fungal foods out there. I mean, it, it feeds the bacteria as well, so you get a good good growth with the bacteria, but uh, specifically, it's an excellent fungal food, which there's not a lot of great ones out there for that. So, um, yeah, yeah, in that that's, regard. that's what I've heard, and I've done that here. I have a decent-sized compost tea brewer, and so that idea of if you're going to use your compost tea on your orchard where you're going for a higher fungal population... Um, and I've definitely heard it both ways of whether to add the hydrolysis at the beginning or wait until the end. But that's interesting about the inhibition on the, on the emulsion, you know, it kind of surprises me a little bit. Um, but yeah, and it was, it was, this was over a decade ago, so I don't want to totally go on record there either, but I will say that there is quite a dramatic difference. I, I can confidently say that between hydrolysate and emulsion from a microbial perspective with hydrolysate being far superior. Now, 
you did mention adding it at the end of a brew. I will say uh, Tim Wilson did a lot of research on this and found that if you add fish hydrolysate at the end of a high quality compost tea brew, you can drop your dissolved oxygen levels within minutes. So it's much, much better to add it at the beginning or use it as a separate application from a compost tea perspective. Uh, at least what we're seeing when we use a dissolved oxygen meter and a microscope to evaluate the quality of a compost tea brew. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, and I, um, I mentioned the dram water division. That's what we're seeing a lot is, is you know, we, we, the main idea at the beginning was a good effective way to clean, clean water using the ozone. The, what's come out of it, um, you know, and we, we, of course, knew dissolved oxygen is good. We had no idea how good. And so studies and, and a lot of the anecdotal evidence coming out of these greenhouses putting on extremely high levels of dissolved oxygen in their water um, as far as um, seedlings doing way better, but, of course, the inhibition of, of pathogens. You know, we, we know that pathogens love anaerobic environments, and they, they don't like high levels of dissolved oxygen, mm -hmm. but that that benefit of, of high levels of dissolved oxygen has become incredibly apparent. So one other key difference, I believe, is that the emulsion tends to have a much stronger odor. I just opened your bottle of hydrolysate, the sample you gave me. And, I mean, it definitely smells like fish. There's no denying that, but it's not overwhelming, though I don't have the best sense of smell either. Um, I, I have heard that emulsion is a much stronger odor. I've heard that too. I've used emulsion. It's been a while since I used an emulsion, obviously, you know, like I, I'm not going out and buying fish emulsion. Um, but I literally have our product on my face right now. Um, <laughs> I was just outside uh, getting, getting a, a dose on our vegetables and I'm, I can be a little bit clumsy when I'm in a hurry and uh, had some splash up on me. And yeah, what we like to say is it smells like fish, you know, um, it doesn't smell like rotten fish. You know, Kurt Dram told me, you know, right off the bat, it smells like the ocean breeze. I like that. I like that description. But yeah, it, it shouldn't smell like rotten fish. And I've heard people say that emulsions are, are a little bit more of an offensive odor. The good part about it, especially outdoor, using it outdoors, is it literally goes away by the next day. You know, so your neighbors, you know, people in, in suburban areas using it on lawns, you can definitely smell it for a couple hours, but it, it, it goes away. Um, I've also heard, you know, you have, some people will add, if, if, if the smell is really a concern, molasses can actually act as a masking agent for it. Um, we've experimented a little bit with, like, peppermint oil and that kind of stuff, but I, I just, you know, it smells like fishy peppermint, which I don't know that that's a whole lot better. I've, I've smelled that. It, it gets a little weird. I agree. Yeah, right. So we've talked a little bit about emulsion, but let's, let's talk a focus really quick on how hydrolysate is made. Right. So how do you, how yeah, do you sure. make this product? Oh. What's that? How do you make this product? Yeah, um, it's funny because it's, it's pretty simple. And, and I'll get into what the complicated part is. It, it's simple, but I wouldn't recommend starting your own plant because of the complications. Uh, so so um, we take scrap from, from the fishing industry. So we're taking all wild fish scrap. After they take the filet off, we'll take everything else. It's really important to us for DRAM, it's really important to us that we get some of the gut material that has the natural enzymes in it. Kind of a just a cool synergistic thing with nature is that those those enzymes in the fish guts help break break down the fish for us. So what we're doing is obtaining scrap. In our case, it's almost all completely from the five Great Lakes, the fishing industry on the five Great Lakes. We'll bring them into our plant in in totes, uh, grind them up. And then we'll digest them. And at that point, we're adding an acid. So all the hydrolysis use an acid at that stage. We prefer to use phosphoric acid. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than the alternative, which would be sulfuric acid. Um, at this point, a lot of people ask how, how we can use phosphoric or sulfuric acid, um, seeing as though on their own, they're not considered organic. Um, and that's the National Organic Standards Board made a ruling that it wouldn't be possible to make fish fertilizer. That fish fertilizer is a necessary ingredient for organic agriculture, and we need to have a, a stabilizing aid. So we're allowed to use enough of it to get it pH stabilized. And so that's the key here, Tad, is that what, what we're really doing is pickling fish guts. <laughs> um, it's not unlike, you know, uh, your grandma making vinegar, vinegar pickles um, and putting them in the pantry. Um, so we're grinding digesting so we're letting it sit in the tank with the acid and digest then we run it through an emulsifier and then a key for dram is that we have 
an incredible amount of storage tanks where we can age the product longer and really let those fine bits of bone break down and get into the liquid. And so that's, that's a big one for us, is we end up with almost always 1% of ca calcium in it, and that is a little bit rare. Um, some of the other companies will, will filter, those, filter that bone out and sell that as a separate product. I'm sure you've seen fish bone meal, or a powder floating around, and that's, that's, um, that would be that product. We're trying to get that into the liquid. Does that give you phosphorus as well? Because I know fishbone meal tends to be high in pea. Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, fishbone, it, it would be high. Yeah. So then that helps us get to that 5% phosphorus number. You know, some, some hydrolysis that are made from like a product, a fish that um, are more like cartilage based, um, they, that would, I, I've seen numbers at three. So you'd see like a two, three, one. Uh, again, 2% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, 1% potassium. So then at the, at the very end, we're, we're screening it and blending it. And so what, what's, what's pretty cool about our, our place is you, you, you go in at, and what's left at the end, um, you know, the, 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 the solids that come out at the end because we're aging it so long is not much at all. You know, like for how much fertilizer comes out of our factory, you know, you'll see a couple 55-gallon drums of solids at the very end. Um, and that's a combination of the enzymes and the fish guts and then the acid breaking down those solids and getting them down to where they can make it through a 200 mesh screen uh, twice before we ship it out. But that's it. And so, and so I got at the point of that it's a fairly simple process. Um, the hard part, Tad, is we're taking something that I just said earlier feeds beneficial biology like nothing else. And then we're trying to stabilize it so we can put it into little bottles and ship it all over the world. Literally, we sell it all over the world and sometimes it doesn't get used for six months. And so that's the tricky part is we're trying to take this, this extremely bioactive product and stabilize it for this moment in time. And so that's all about hitting this correct pH. Um, there's other factors besides pH, you know, as far as getting it stable. Um, so just so I understand it, you get in all of these, this, these fish guts and fish carcasses, essentially this byproduct. It goes into a giant tank or multiple tanks, and then the phosphoric acid is added first as a way of establishing a, a pH, a target pH that you're aiming for. Is that right? Right. Otherwise, we would end up smelling like the emulsion you're talking about, right? So if, if, if we're not pH stabilizing that early in the process, you're going to start to have a putrefaction. Okay, so then you hit this pH, and then that sort of stabilizes everything. And then at that point, you're, you say you emulsify it, so you're just mixing it really well. And then the natural enzymes in the fish are breaking down all the organic matter, I guess you would say, the, the carcasses themselves um, over time. And then when you're done, are you restabilizing it? Or is, is that really the whole step to the no, process? We, well, we do need to check. So we, ha we do check before it goes out the door to make sure it's within the pH parameters quality control pH parameters, right? So, so somewhere in between 3.5 and 4 pH. Um, okay. So that's, yeah, if we do need to, we, in, rather than adjusting, we'll do like blending if we do ever do have a problem there, you know, where we're, we're up above where we want to be or, or um, in that situation, you know. Um, and a lot of times there, there's wiggle room there as far as if being above 4, we'd probably still be all right. It's just we really prefer to have it um, in that range. So there shouldn't be any real microbes coming in on it at that point because of the, the high acidity. Is that, is that right? And that's what allows it to stay stable in the bottle? Right, except there is some life. Um, so we're good on, the, the good news is that pH range kills the really bad guys. So salmonella, E. coli, and so on. Um, there will be some life if we stick it under a microscope, um, but not enough life to make, say, a 275-gallon tote blow up. <laughs> which, which if you talk to people, veterans of the uh, fish fertilizer industry, everybody's got a story, right, of, of something getting away from them. And a lot of times that happens that more often with the sulfuric acid products. Um, that's part of the reason we don't like to use the cheaper sulfuric acid um, is there's a reaction going on between the, the fish bone or, or any of the solids and the acid, where as that bone gets broken down, the pH will rise. And when we use sulfuric acid, that tends to happen uh, faster or less predictably, I guess would be the best way to say it. And so you'd be more likely to have a pH shoot up when you don't want it to be. 
but to answer your question, there, you know, some of this is a little bit unknown to us of, you know, um, at what exact parameters. And so we're constantly logging and trying to learn um, uh, more about that. So people really aren't making their own fish hydrolysate at home. Uh, they might be making it more of a fish emulsion, it sounds like. Um, if you were to take fish and grind it up and then uh, let, apply it to your, your plants, that's essentially an emulsion, uh, more or less. Uh, yeah, except I don't know that the, I mean, I, I, you're emulsifying fish, and so I guess, you know, I could stick a trout in my Vitamix here. <laughs> that would technically be an emulsified trout. You know, whether that would actually be what, what on the market is sold as fish emulsion, you know, because the, in that case there is a, a, a heating process and stuff removed. But yeah, okay. I have seen some some YouTube videos of some guys making homemade. What I've recommended to people is because it does happen where where somebody gets a, a line on say a university doing studies on fish and having these fish carcasses that they need to dispose of. Um, and actually, yeah, Bullock's Permaculture Farm where I live, they had a, a great story about that where they had a line on all this fish, and so they, and this is what I do recommend is compost it, hot compost it. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you have the means to do it, get a lot of uh, good carbon source. But if I remember that story, you know, from 20 years ago, there was that, was that uh, they buried it all, uh, you know, in the compost pile and then maybe forgot about it. Somebody forgot about it and went and tried to move it with the tra tractor loader. And there's, you know, not much worse smells than that of, you know, rotten, anaerobic rotten fish. Uh, so you just want to keep it aerated, obviously. Yeah. And uh, wild animals are going to go crazy yep. for that. So that's yeah, the other risk. Right. But um as someone who's hoping to get into fishing here as a personal hobby as I get older, uh, I have heard of people taking those fish guts and burying them right into their gardens. Um, Native Americans used to put them under their, uh, I believe under their corn or tomato plants and things like that. So uh, people can definitely use fish in those ways. And there's so much information online people can go read about, about that. But it is important to, I think, differentiate that hydrolysate is a totally different product that you're not um, you're not making it at home I guess is what I, the point I wanted to get across to people um, right one thing you touched on was shelf life you said six months like that was a long time what isn't what is a good shelf life for these products do we need to worry about that when we're buying them from say a garden center or a you don't you know we need to put a, a shelf life on it you know just um, because that's what you do um, there's some people who think that there's actually a continual breakdown going on in the bottle. I'm not sure that that's true as far as the microscopic, you know, um, uh, solids that make it through the 200 mesh screen. But I would be, I would feel perfectly comfortable if I found, you know, out in my barn, an old bottle from eight years ago when I started working for, for DRAM um, using it. I, the, the way that I say it, like I've, said it a couple times already is uh, treat it like you would a jar of pickles that you made a jar of vinegar pickles that you made um, that you found in your pantry and I just just ate some uh, uh, spicy pickled asparagus from 2015 yesterday and it tasted just fine you know what I'm saying so so if it's pH stabilized nothing should be happening in there and so um, that is an advantage of the hydrolysis versus some of the other, you know, like biological um, amendments you'd be buying in the organic world. Yeah, I've got I got a 50 ground 50 gallon drum right now at my farm that we found. Who knows how old it is? It could be two to five years now. Um, I don't know quite what I'm going to do with it yet, but it didn't have a really bad odor, so I was just going to use my nose sort of as a guide there and hopefully still use it on my on my plants. So the one thing that wouldn't be un uncommon there. Ted is um, is for you to look down into that drum and see some white mold on the top, and when that's been tested, it's it's a simple bread mold. I mean, you know, if you want to be really careful, you would actually get it tested. But a lot of times, what that would be is a, a very simple, safe bread mold, um, and so you just need to filter that out. But I would feel I would feel okay using that personally. Yeah, and I don't worry too much about um, these sorts of things when I'm applying them to ornamentals or to soil directly because I think that nature kind of handles a lot of that. Now, spraying it directly onto my finished vegetables or my crops is probably something I wouldn't recommend. But uh, Exactly, yep. Yeah, there, I think you just have to look at different materials and treat them differently depending on uh, all these circumstances. So we talked a little bit about how fish hydrolysate is made versus 
the difference between that and emulsion. Can you talk a little bit about the, the quality and the differences? Now, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus regarding other companies, uh, but I've heard, you know, there, there's a bunch of companies out there making this, you know, just to throw some names out there, Organic Gem, Neptune's Harvest, uh, the, what's the one close to me, Pacific? Pacific Grow. Pacific yep. Grow. So there, there's other companies making fish hydrolysate, and some are putting in, you know, biochar, you're putting in kelp, um, I've, I've heard of some putting in crustacean meal. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the, are, are there differences, I guess, across these different companies besides like maybe the species of the fish? Is it all the exact same process? Yeah, you're, I mean, obviously that's a tough spot for me because um, uh, what I can really speak about is our process, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what we're doing that I've kind of uh, went in depth on. Um, so yes, there's a difference between ocean, ocean or the, 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 a difference is ocean fish versus um, uh, our fish from the Great Lakes. But just because a place is on the coast doesn't necessarily mean that it's all ocean, ocean fish. Um, so I don't know that that's a conclusion you want to draw. In, in this case, I think that pretty much is the case that the, the, the ones that the, the companies you mentioned on the coast are using ocean fish. Are you going to see uh, higher sodium levels in fish drawn from saltwater versus freshwater? Or do they wash them so thoroughly? I, is that not retained in the flesh? I believe so. I don't know that it's going to be harm, you know, at the levels that you're using fish, unless you're, you know, we do have some growers who really dive in and use, you know, over a hundred gallons per acre, you know, hop growers really like our fertilizer a lot. And some of them will use extremely high volumes of it um, to the point where if we had higher sodium levels in ours, that would be detrimental. Um, or if you're in the, you know, in Eastern Washington, you know, near where we live, um, on the other side of the mountains where there's just not enough rainfall to wash out that sodium um, and you were using extremely high levels. But I, I don't have a recent comparison of, of our lake fish versus ocean fish of whether it's really a big difference in sodium levels. As far as process, I can't speak to that as much. I mean, you can always look at the NPK and get an idea from that. So when I said the, the, um, uh, the lower uh, phosphorus levels, the, it's possible that the bone is being pulled out earlier in this, and sold as a separate product. Um, I would ask if, if you think calcium is important, like I do in almost, you know, most crops or all crops, um, especially like apple growers in eastern Washington trying to prevent bitter pit. I say, hey, if you're buying somebody else's fish, just ask them, you know, for a, a lab analysis showing what their calcium is. Um, that's something we're proud of in ours. I'm trying to think of, of oh, and then, yeah, you, you hit on it a little bit. We, we do um, several different blends with ours. And um, so we have a fish, a fish and kelp. We have a fish, kelp, fulvic, and humic acid um, product. And then we also will dissolve uh, sodium nitrate or Chilean nitrate into um, some of our blends to get a 4% or 5% nitrogen product that has a um, quick-release organic nitrogen source. Um, along with that slow release, oh, sorry, sorry, we have the, the, the quick release nitrate nitrogen source uh, in the Chilean nitrate that's still certified organic, um, mm -hmm. and then that slower release nitrogen from the, the other 2% of the nitrogen. And so I really like that combination, especially, you know, like I said, I was just out uh, fertilizing vegetables here in the Skagit Valley where the soil takes forever to warm up, you know, and three feet above sea level. And so getting that little bit of nitrate into those plants as they're, they're popping up here in the, in the spring is really important. Um, so those are things, you know, as far as um, different blends that the, that the companies make um, would be a difference. You hit on it at the beginning is if you're asking, making sure you're getting a uh, hydrolysis, if, if, if one of your goals is to really amp up your, your biology and your organic system, you're, you're already you know, starting out really well, you know, they're, they're, they're just, a, you, you really should be thinking of emulsions and hydrolysis as two very different things, not as all being fish fertilizer. Okay, so start with the idea that uh, uh, hydrolysis are going to be superior in a lot of ways to emulsions, but um, one of the things, I, like you said, is there's different ones that are put, people are putting in different, uh, different ingredients, and I think it's important that people look further into that. So, like, and again, this is not a comment on any particular product in general or company, but I've seen some they're adding biochar, 
which on the surface sounds great. Now, we don't know the quality of the biochar and we don't know the concentration of biochar. So that's the sort of stuff that as a grower, I would wanna look further into. And I don't actually know the answer to these questions in those particular products, but that's what I would wanna know before I started really um, getting heavy into applying them. And same with you know, even the kelp or the crustacean to find out sort of what levels are gonna be in there. Because I know getting something on a label versus putting enough in to actually make a noticeable change in your crop it can be very different. Uh, based on the bureaucracy around the fertilizer industry. So, and the other thing I want to touch on too is you mentioned that your product sits a lot longer than uh, maybe traditionally done by some of these other hydrolysate companies. Um, that's another thing I would look into when I'm trying to de determine quality uh, of a product. So, uh, just just some things, some pointers for listeners to maybe think about as they consider using fish products in their garden. And uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on <laughs> that I know is a little tricky for you too is just the idea that when you look at a bottled nutrient, an organic bottled nutrient product, whether it's a, a bottled nutrient line from pretty much any company out there in the cannabis industry, if they list uh, fish on the on the label, uh, as I understand, it's most likely fish hydrolysate. Is that correct? Yeah, really tough for me to answer. You know, I mean, I know that we do work with some of those companies sending ingredients over, right? Um, but very difficult for me to answer whether some of them are using emulsion and what, you know, the labeling laws are so tricky. And as I'm sure you know, is like each state has different regulations to the point where you, it's not even legally possible to have the same fertilizer label you have in Oregon as the same label you have in California, where the requirements are, are at odds with each other. Um, and so as far as what you're required to list on there, and I think some of those cases, so I'm, I'm very lucky in that I am not the person that DRAM has to, has to deal with all that. Um, uh, we thank our friend Tim Daly for, for, um, being the one who has to jump through those hoops. But if you're using, you know, as you're alluding to, if, if they're adding a, 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 such a small amount of some of this stuff where they're just trying to put it on, you can um, actually omit some of that from the label, um, is my understanding in some states. So, I, you know, the best thing to do is to ask. And in that case, it's a little bit harder to ask. And that's what I was going to, you know, say about comparing the fish fertilizers. A lot of times, um, or usually in our case, it's sold through distribution. And so that's a little bit trickier, but a lot of times our distributors will send customers straight to us and I'm totally fine. I'm happy with that. You know, I mean, I'm proud of the way we make our fertilizer. Um, but that would be my advice for, for your listeners is ask, you know, um, if, if you're buying from a, a, a certain um, label and they're obviously not a fish fertilizer producer is send them an email and say, Hey, Whose fish fertilizer are you using? You know, they might got, they probably won't give you the answer to that, but is it a hydrolysis or is it an emulsion? Yeah, at the very least, they can tell you that. And the labeling laws are a mess. I got to tell you, I've been working on our California label now for a year and a half. It sucks. It's just, it's been terrible. <laughs> like here in Washington, I can call us Kiss Organics, but in California, I can't unless all of our products are certified for use in organic or agriculture by them, which I totally get because it can be misleading to consumers, but they're just very, uh, they're very strict in terms of what they allow and don't allow. And they don't accept OMRI, they don't accept WSDA. And uh, it's, it's been really eye opening. Like, um, for example, with your product being a 250.2, uh, in Washington, Oregon, you could actually have uh, 5% nitrogen or 10% phosphorus in theory on the label or on your, uh, on your tests but you don't have to declare that on your actual label. So if you were- Which five, is crazy, you know, and that gets in, you know, you and I could go on for a while and I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get too into hear it. it, for sure. But it's crazy that, you know, because there's laws in some places about phosphorus fertilizers because of runoff, mm -hmm. and that it's my understanding that you can put down a zero for phosphorus, even though you have 5% phosphorus in it, to get around those, to get around the labeling laws that are supposed to, supposed to prevent people from dumping too much on their lawns and having it go into their, the, the lake next door. Um, so yeah, some of it's crazy. Um, we fight through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, it probably is a whole nother podcast. So, uh, I just, I just want to encourage people to really look into the sourcing and, and, 
and use that as a guide for determining quality when they're evaluating different products in general, not just not just fish products. But let's get back into uh, some of the aspects of applying these products. So this is a liquid, it's a concentrate. Uh, you're gonna be mixing it with water. Can you talk a little bit about application rates and methods for applying uh, fish hydrolysate? Yes, um, and so one of the big advantages uh, for me is that fish fertilizer is used in so many different ways. And so it, it, there is no one size fits all or this is how much to use and this is the way to put it on. Um, so that's a strength of, of our fertilizer and most liquid organic fertilizers is um, there's a lot of ways to put them on. That said, I'll, I will get into some of the, the obstacles. Um, so you can apply it straight on the plant. You can apply it on the soil. Um, one way I really like for, especially for larger growers, is dripping it on, on the seed at planting. Um, getting back to what we talked about, about its ability to grow beneficial fungus. You know, if you can put your your mind there on that seed popping up and having that what I call the, the fungal force field, you know, that the beautiful bright white mycelium um, helping protect that plant from, from pathogens. Um, I love that idea. Um, so we, but we do have a lot of growers who use it as a foliar applica application. Um, we get anecdotal reports of, of fungicidal effects. And there are some studies of fish products um, going back on like blueberries showing some, you know, fungicidal um, properties and, I don't know whether it's oils preventing those kind of things or um, whether it's more just promoting biodiversity and, and creating an environment in which pathogens aren't interested in, in thriving. Um, sorry, getting off topic. Uh, as far as application rates, um, uh, in general, a lot of folks will use it not as their primary um, source of nutrients. And so they'll be using some sort of dry fertilizer or cover crop. Um, in that situation, two to five gallons per acre per application is common. So the five gallons more for, for like orchards and so on. Um, I'd say the most common rates would be a, a, a two gallons per acre per application three times during the growing season. That's a really common one. And so when you get into cost on that, say, say you're buying the fertilizer for, for five or six bucks a gallon, you're not talking about a big investment um, to add into your program. So when you're, you're talking about acreage right now, uh, a lot of our guys maybe, let's say they had a small, small garden. So they're maybe applying it by the gallon of water. Um, are, are you adding like what, like maybe an ounce or so per gallon or Right, or yeah, so if we're getting into dilution rates, um, the two most common dilution rates would be a 20 parts water to one part fertilizer. Okay. Um, that's probably, that's the most common. Some folks prefer a 50 to one. In a lot of cases, though, it comes down to, you know, I've had it here where I'm traveling a lot for work and I miss, I'm only able to get my one application in. So I'll go for a stronger fertilizer. So I'll be using a stronger amount and a stronger dilution ratio. And I'm not at all scared to get down to 10 to 1 um, with our fertilizer. Um, and I would even go stronger dilution rate than that. I did some experiments here trying to, you know, just using a backpack sprayer, going with some because the, the concern, the next question would usually be, how low can I go or how strong of a, of a um, dilution ratio can I go before I start burning stuff? And I went to like three to one on our product that has the sodium nitrate in it. And I saw a little bit of brown spots on some broccoli, you know, but that was where it looked like straight fish fertilizer coming out of the end of the, um, end of the sprayer. Um, so the versatility, so, so in, in, but in some cases folks will, will do five, seven applications. You know, if you're already going out with your tractor, the fish is really compatible um, and in fact can work as a spreader sticker um, for other products. And so some people just like to mix a little bit of fish in their tank with just about everything. Now, because of the phosphoric acid, you want to avoid using it with calcium products. Um, I'm sure, you, sure you've heard that, you know, those two, two guys don't get along. Uh, you'll have a precipitate um, fallout. Now, are you pHing the solution? at all prior to application? I'm not, I, I, I don't, I, you know, so, so we're, it's gonna come out of our bottle at a 3.5 to four. Um, and then by the time you dilute that, it pops up quite a bit. Um, that's not an area. I mean, a lot of times, a, a lot of your listeners have, have programs and ways to test that stuff and I just don't even get into it. And again, I sell, you know, 
uh, I sell a lot through distribution, um, and so I don't end up working directly with, with those growers. And what about growers in eastern Washington that have a lot of calcium in their water already? Do they need to treat that prior to using that water with application? Do you know? That's a good question. I, I don't know that. Okay. Well, um, hopefully the people that have high calcium waters already know how to deal with that because we're really fortunate here uh, in the in the western Washington to not have... We have wonderful water. That's That's one of the best things about living here. Yeah. So you mentioned a little bit about affordability. You know, you threw out some numbers like uh, I think you said seven to eight dollars a gallon. Uh, that sounds low to me, but so you must be talking about buying on scale. Is that correct? Yeah, that's where you get into the single digits when you're when you're going fifty-five gallon drums or larger. And so that's a big question. You know, a, a lot of the listeners for your podcast are going to be that's a, a decision that they would make of. The two point so so our next size lower than a fifty five gallon drum is a five gallon size and so that's two two and a half gallon jugs and that's what we decided to go with rather than the five gallon bucket. People really like the convenience of those the fact that you can just pick up a two two point five gallon jug and shake it you know and um, get it nice and agitated. Mm -hmm. So I think where you're going with the question and where where where. Um, the big question is, is it worth it to scale up to a 55 gallon drum that you have to get shipped on a, on a, on a semi um, that's going to weigh 600 pounds. So you have to deal with it. Um, but you're going to pay about a third of the price per gallon. Um, and so if you're going to go through that much and then another big advantage of fish hydrolysis is that if you could use half that drum in one season and then use the rest the next season. And again, you know, watch for, you know, whether bread mold will grow on it in between, you know, if you're not using it for, for seven months, you just check on those things. But that's what you'd be looking at is, is saving that kind of thing. So say $5, 5 to $6 per gallon in the 55 gallon drum. And I, I'm using vague numbers um, for a couple of reasons is it depends, you know, how close it is to you with the shipping and everything. But yeah. then also um, we sell several different blends that are all different price points. You know, the more, more extra amendments we put in, the higher the price gets. But then you'd be getting up to say fifteen, sixteen, seventeen dollars a gallon in in the two point five gallon jugs, if that gives you a good idea of the difference. Yeah, a range. And then of I course we sell gallon. we sell gallons and quarts and, and and all of that too for even smaller amounts. But a lot of times that's the big decision a grower has to make is should I save the extra money on the fifty five gallon drum? But then I gotta you know you have to use a paint mixer on the end of a power drill. It's really not that bad, and you have to have a fifty five gallon drum pump. Um, but those are all the considerations to make. Um, you know, and the more frugal growers, you know, will will go ahead and do the 55 gallon drum, and sometimes growers will just say, "I, I don't want to deal with that." Yeah, I, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to Kurt Becker about uh, applications and spraying, and he's a genius in that. I know he works for Dram as well. I got the opportunity to meet him last year. And... He's, the, he's the man. Yeah, he's um, <laughs> he really he just, is. He knows that stuff inside and out of. Uh, of what you what the best solution is for your problem in your greenhouse. So we'll we'll dive into spraying and and all of that a little more with him. Uh, you did mention drip systems as being a little bit problematic. I can't remember if you had talked about them yet uh, on this podcast. Say it again. Uh, you'd mentioned drip I, systems as being a little bit problematic for yeah, growers. Yeah, that's where I was going to go with that. Thank thank you for reminding me. Is that that's the big question we get? Is can I put your stuff through our drip system? You know, and and it's gonna. The answer to that is going to depend a little bit on what type of drip system you have, how long you want to, you know, some people will bury their lines and, and want to keep them for several years. Um, my answer, my first answer is I don't put it through drip at my place. And I recommend if you can put it on any other way than putting it through a drip system, do that. Now, you still get people, growers, where their system is just not going to have another way to get it on. Um, and so if you're going to use it to drip, and lots of people do, and this would be for our fish hydrolysis or for any liquid organic fertilizer, is you just have to be vigilant about flushing with water. And then I recommend you occasionally using some sort of organic, you know, biocide. So um, you got to make sure you're sticking on label, you know, with things like um, what Oxidate or Sanidate or the, um, I'm hesitant to even say it on a podcast because I don't know what, you know, things would be allowed for it. There's also some enzyme products. And I don't know, are you familiar with, there's something EF300, a guy in California makes that I've heard great things about. And I might have the name of that product wrong. I know you've had Chris Jagger on the podcast. And I think 
uh, Chris would be the go-to for that. He's, he's got a, an enzyme product that he really likes for eating up living stuff in the lines. Um, so that's your concern is, I'll say it again, nothing feeds, <laughs> feeds beneficial fungus and bacteria like uh, fish hydrolysis, but sometimes it feeds those in places you don't want it, and that would be the inside of your drip line, right? So algae growth and, and so on. Yeah, we're trying to avoid, avoid that biofilm. So if you right, have a larger, exactly. let's say you're putting it through piping that you could reach your finger into if it feels slimy or anything like that, that's that biofilm created by the uh, biology that's eating as a food source. And that's what that one, it, Tad, is a really good place to go with Kurt Becker. He knows a lot. You know, that's that's where our ozone systems are are, are big on, um, you know, it's, it's a common problem. How do we get rid of that biofilm in our um, irrigation system? And that's something he's really uh, dove into coming up with solutions for growers on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to him. There's so much I didn't even think about when it came to spraying that, uh, yeah, I'm excited for that. You know, uh, Suzanne's always saying stop using paint sprayers, and uh, he really explains what the difference is in terms of the actual size of the molecule or drip that you're applying, and it, it's, it was fascinating. I really enjoyed his presentation, so I'm looking forward to that for sure. Now, uh, let's see, for you, the other, the other question I had then was, can you use like a, so for example, at my house here, I just put in a new lawn of, of sod and I was going to take the sample you gave me and put it through a hose end sprayer as a way to get it out onto the, onto the lawn. Uh, what do you think of, of something like that? That works great. So we even sell, you know, like the, the, the small retail bottles with that hose end sprayer thing attached to them. Okay. Um, you know, so that works great. Another one that I've done here is, are you familiar, Dram actually sells the Siphonject. Are you familiar with that product? No, no. So it's, it's kind of the next step down from like the smallest Dositron. Um, and it's just this incredibly simple technology, a little Venturi um, injector. And you take that little, you, you can look on the internet for a Dram Siphonject. I think they're less than $20. And uh, it's got a little hose line. Um, so you can do it a couple different ways. The one thing you need to make sure is that you're following all the rules on how to use it if you want to make absolute certain that you're um, pulling the product, the fertilizer, out of the bottle at the right dilution rate. And now for our product, it doesn't really matter that much if you're doing, you know, you're not going to, especially for how you're talking about using it, if mm -hmm. you're pulling it out at twice the dilution ratio, it doesn't really matter that much. What I'm getting at is you, you would um, you could either put it on the front of the hose or the back of the hose, so back at the spigot, and then you put the little hose thing um, down into your fertilizer bottle. You um, screw that onto the spigot, and then you screw the hose onto that part. And so it's a little bit difficult to describe over the phone here, but um, then it you start spraying with your with your hose and go through a normal water wand, um, and you are pulling an exact dilution ratio. I'm pretty sure it's 50 to one. I should know that. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's incredibly totally. simple technology of a injector that, you know, you're not plugging it into an outlet. You're not doing anything like that. It's just really simple. Yeah. So at my house we have, I'm on city water, so there's chlorine in the water. So I'm, I'm going to apply things like this uh, fish hydrolysate, the dramatic K here that you gave me and things like seaweed extract powder through yep. my hose end sprayer, because I'm not applying anything that really has a lot of, beneficial microorganisms in it or that's not the point of the application it's a food source whereas when i go to apply uh, my compost tea to my garden i'm not going to use that same sprayer because i haven't filtered out the chlorine and i would want to also determine that that sprayer doesn't damage the bacteria um, or break up the fungal hyphae during the application but for things that are just food sources or nutrients uh, I, th I think it'll work great yeah, I would uh, I would love to talk to you more off <laughs> offline about that because that's I have chlorinated water here at our farm also, which surprises people. But you know, like I said, we're I'm three feet above sea level here, and we we just don't have well water where I'm at in the Skagit Valley. And um, so I always wonder about that when I was making compost teas and so on. I'm obviously not going to run. <laughs> When I brew beer here at the farm, I run everything through a Brita, you know, or run everything through a water filter. But I'm obviously not going to do that for irrigating crops. Um, so I, I often wonder about how to handle that situation. I just put up a um, photo on our Instagram, also on our Facebook page for Kiss Organics, of uh, compost tea that had been uh, 
made or, or added to uh, chlorinated water versus dechlorinated water. And you can see they're in Petri dishes and it's a dramatic difference. And I'm gonna be interviewing a, a golf course superintendent that I met, oh boy, almost a decade ago that uh, has gotten into uh, using organics and beneficial biology and he's reduced his fertilizer applications on his golf courses something like 70 percent because golf courses are are terrible when it comes to the amount of pesticides and uh, uh, inorganic fertilizers that they have to use to keep the grass looking the way you know golfers want it to look so uh, go check that out you might find it interesting and you and i can definitely talk offline about uh, about that for sure um, in terms of compost tea but yeah, no, I'll definitely check that out. Thanks. Well, I think we covered all the questions I had on on fish for the day, and, and hopefully this will help listeners uh, know a little bit more about the differences primarily between emulsion and hydrolysate and how to use the product and, and all of its benefits. And um, yeah, I think I think we covered a lot here, so thanks for that. Well, I appreciate it, Dad. It was, it was fun. And if people want to get a hold of Casey or have other questions and are interested in trying out some of the DRAM fish products, I will put all that information right on the podcast page as well. So um, you can get a hold of him or you can contact me and I can get you his information. I appreciate that. All right. I'll let you get back out to your farm. Thanks again for today. (laughs) Take care, Dad. All right. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. That was Casey Schoenberger, the Director of Sales for DRAM Corporation's Fertilizer and Farm Segments. You can find many of their smaller sizes online or in local garden centers. And if you're interested in the five gallon size or larger, you can reach Casey directly to place an order at 360-333-4044 or via his email, which I will have on the podcast page. Don't forget to mention the podcast. You are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey. Don't forget that there's more information and articles available on our website and blog at www.kisorganics.com, as well as links to the data and information we discussed in this episode on the podcast page. Thanks for listening.